Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. In October of 2021, the publication Vulture released an interview with Dave Grohl. In this interview, Dave Grohl reflected on how at one point, Kurt Cobain was considering firing him from Nirvana. Dave was asked the following question during the interview. Quote, Michael Azarad wrote a piece recently with stories from his time around Nirvana, and one stuck out. He said there was a night during the American tour for In Utero when Kurt was yelling in his hotel room about firing you. Michael Azarad told Kurt it was perfectly plausible that you, being in the room next door, had heard him. I wondered if you did. End quote. This was Dave's response. Quote, I hadn't, but I have kind of a different version of that story. We were on our way to Los Angeles to start production rehearsals for the In Utero tour, and I was sitting a few rows ahead of Kurt and Chris. I could hear Kurt saying, I think we need a drummer that's more rudimental, along the lines of Dan Peters. End quote. Dan Peters, of course, was the last drummer that Nirvana had worked with prior to hiring Dave Grohl. Dan Peters is known predominantly for his work with Mudhoney, but he has done other work as well, including a short stint with Nirvana in the summer and early fall of 1990. Now, going back to Dave Grohl, in this interview with Vulture from October of 2021, he elaborated further on what his reaction was when he heard Kurt Cobain say they wanted a drummer along the lines of Dan Peters. Quote, I was really upset because I thought things were okay. I talked to Chris and I said, is that really what you guys want to do? Because if that's what you want, maybe just let me know and we can call it a day. I eventually talked to Kurt about it and he said, no, that's not what we want to do. I just felt like it's up to you guys what kind of drummer you really want. But they decided I should stay. End quote. Dave wasn't asked the following. How close was the band to coming apart or being completely restructured? This is what Dave had to say. Quote, Honestly, in that last year, you would wake up every day not knowing what was going to happen next. We were on shaky ground for a lot of reasons. The biggest being that the sudden rise to fame in that band was traumatic. I can't speak for Kurt. And I don't usually because he's not around to speak for himself. Each of us dealt with it in different ways, but ultimately, that's a hard thing to navigate. We had shunned the mainstream commercial appeal and were perfectly happy in our world behind the shadows, but then we became one of them. How do you process that? There was a lot of chaos within and outside the band. You had to hang on for dear life and hope the ride didn't stop. End quote. Furthermore, Dave Grohl did tell biographer Paul Brannigan that he did overhear Kurt talking badly about him on a plane. This was mentioned in Dave's biography, This Is A Call, which was released in 2011. In this biography, This Is A Call, Dave also confirms that he wanted to quit the band because he was fed up with the tension in Nirvana and was upset about what Kurt had said on the plane. Their tour manager, Alex McLeod, talked him out of it. Now, as mentioned, this all took place right around the time of the In Utero tour on the kickoff of the tour getting ready for it. During one of my interviews with Steve Albini, the producer of In Utero, he went deep into detail about the making of that album and some of the tensions behind the scenes. Though, the tensions behind the scenes that Steve Albini was talking about were predominantly the tensions between him and the record label. One of the things which really complicated the dynamics within Nirvana was all the corporate pressure on top of the band. That pressure not only impacted Dave, Kurt, and Chris, but also the people around them. And in this case, within Utero, specifically it impacted Steve Albini. I'm going to show you a clip now from one of my interviews with Steve Albini where he goes really deep into detail about what exactly happened between him and the record label. How the label essentially went after him and in Steve's own words tried to ruin his career. All the interviews on my channel are original. I'm the one arranging them by myself. If you guys want to see more and if you want to help me make more videos, the best way is to subscribe to the channel. It really goes a long way. Thank you for your support and if you want to see the full interview with Steve Albini, the link is available in the description box below. So you, know, you did something very unique that most producers don't do. Uh, you took a flat rate to work with the band instead of taking the typical royalty thing, even though you may have made more money with that. Uh, what was your reasoning behind that? If, if you were doing some creative endeavor, right, mm -hmm. and I was facilitating your creative endeavor, I just don't see that, that it's reasonable that you should, for the rest of your life, you should be beholden to me. I genuinely don't feel like I'm being a, an overly generous person in this regard. I just feel like if you see a room full of people and they're all behaving horribly and you just carry on your normal life not behaving horribly, that doesn't make you noble. You know, that doesn't mean that you're an extra special person. It just means that there was all of this awful shit going on and you didn't participate in it. 
Hmm. Interesting way of looking at things, yeah. So, um, speaking of the, you know, some of the bad stuff that happened, uh, interestingly, that letter you sent to Nirvana, you specifically stated, you know, potential problems that may run into you with the label. When those exact problems you foretold actually did happen, I'm assuming you weren't surprised. So how did how did you take it? Uh, like you said, I, I wasn't surprised. There was an active attempt to to wreck my career on the part of the people associated with that record, that record label. And, uh, I'm, you know, clearly it didn't, it didn't work. Like I'm still here making records every day and they're all selling insurance or timeshares or something, you know? Yeah. So I, I don't feel bad about the way things turned out, but that was a rough year. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry you had to go through that. When did you first, yeah. when did you Chase first realize that this was happening, that this was starting to develop these problems? Um, well, the first inkling was when the band called me and said, yeah, the record label and the management hate the record. They want, they want us to redo it all. And I was like, yeah, I kind of saw that one coming. I mean, I think the trajectory of that record, that is them going off to make the record on their own, the record label stamping their feet about it and trying to get them to change it, them ultimately making some changes, the record coming out in a, in a way that, um, was less than satisfying for me, given that the, their record label and their management tried to scapegoat me like pretty aggressively prior to the release. Like all of that, that whole trajectory, I think that was kind of preordained. I don't think there's any way they could have gotten out of that record without something like that happening. Whoever the, their engineer was, something on that spectrum was going to happen. Some, some combination of those those events was going to happen mm -hmm. given that it did i feel like they navigated it about as well as anybody could mm -hmm. for my part i might have been I'm, I'm, I'm i was more of a prick then I, I was more like willing to irritate people and so i think i was probably i was probably a little coarser about uh my reaction to it to all of those things than was necessary and I, I'd like to think that I wouldn't behave that way now. It was a very dark time for me. The year after I did that record, I almost went, I went completely broke the year after making that record. Um, there was an, a, there was an aggressive campaign on the part of Geffen Records, um, to, to discredit me or embarrass me or try to cause me harm which was effective in that I lost a lot of business in the, in the intervening year or so. But I don't personalize that toward the band. I feel like the band were the, the one party in all of this who were not taking shots at me, you know? Yeah. They were very circumspect when they were talking about the process of making the record in interviews and stuff like they, they, didn't want to ruffle any feathers. And so they didn't personalize their complaints um, very much. I'm gratified by the fact that they didn't scapegoat me to the extent, you know, that their record label and their management did. Uh, it's, it was a surreal experience to have this big corporation have invested a lot of money and their sort of publicity capital in a record by the biggest band in the world and have those very self-same people shit talking me to music journalists and other people in the music business and actively trying to cause me harm. That was a very surreal experience for them to be shitting on this record that was obviously very important to them. From a business standpoint, it was going to be a huge record. And I just didn't get why they were shitting on the record. And then as a secondary effect, shitting on me, I just didn't get it. And it was a, it was an unpleasant period for me the year after making that record. I saw a big drop off in my normal clientele, like the smaller bands that I was working with, the independent bands. A, a lot of them were suspicious of me now because I had been working, I'd worked on this big hit record and that 
that made them suspicious of me and my motives. Like Mm -hmm. there was a kind of a normal career trajectory where somebody would start out in the underground and they would start to get noticed and then they would become sort of a mainstream player and then unavailable to anybody who wasn't a like a, a big name. Yeah. Something similar to that had happened with Butch Vig, like who who was a hero in the underground in the punk scene. Then his name was associated with Nirvana, and suddenly, you nobody that he had none of the bands that were his bread and butter in the years prior, none of them could get him get him to answer a phone call, and that's just a result of him moving into a sort of a professional tier where those bands didn't have access, right? Mm-hmm. So there was a suspicion of me that that was going to that 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 was sort of expected to happen with me, that I would now be unavailable to all of my normal clientele. So that normal clientele disappeared or dropped off dramatically. And then. The sort of mainstream or major label artists were being actively discouraged from working with me, and I know this because I have friends who were in the process of making records in the year or two after that, yeah. who were told explicitly by their handlers that they were not allowed to work with me. They could work with basically anybody else. They just weren't allowed to work with me. That's um, crazy that this happened to you. Well, <laughs> I, it was a boys club. It was an in, it was a, it was a closed circle in the mainstream music business. And I represented a way of working that would negate that network yeah. And so I'm not surprised at all that people were discouraged from working with me. But I can imagine um, that there must have been other individuals who are also very much in line with the punk ethos. Why were they so intimidated by you in particular? I don't know that people were intimidated by me. I think that people saw me as a liability. Like if you're in a, if you're involved with a, a big record label and your relationship with them is somewhat fragile, meaning that they could they could wreck you. They could ruin your career. You would not want to antagonize those people by working with someone that they saw as uh, an obstacle or that they saw as someone that they saw as an impediment to them doing their normal, going through their normal modes of behavior. And then if you were a small band and you were, you aspired to being picked up by one of these big record labels and it was made clear to you that I was a pariah in that world, you also wouldn't want to associate yourself with me because you wouldn't want to be tarred with this brush of, oh, they're a a defiant um, indie band and they, you know, yeah, that would, they would close some doors on themselves if they did that. So I, I, you know, I basically had to rebuild my clientele from the, you know, the deep underground network from the, you know, the peer group of people who were not part of that aspirational world. And I had, you know, existing clients, people that I had worked with for years that, that stuck with me, but I had to rebuild my new clientele from the ground up, basically. Jeez. I'll never forget the moment. There was a moment, maybe six months or so after the release of that record where I did I I had did the books on the studio and I paid all the utilities and I paid the salaries for the other employees and I paid the insurance and I paid everything and and I had 50 cents in the bank like my bank balance after paying all my bills and paying doing payroll and the mortgage and everything my my bank balance was 50 cents and that was you know unusual for me at the time because I had been working very steadily and I had built up a bit of a cushion, which allowed me to survive that fallow period. You know, the, the band made the record on their own terms. 